Even after a century of glass and steel, when we think of public buildings, we still think of columns and porticos. The very first temple form political building in America, or indeed the modern world, was the new State House in Richmond, Virginia, designed by Jefferson in 1785. Jefferson was totally enraptured by an ancient Roman temple he visited in Nîmes, the Maison Carré, or Square House. Here I am, madame, he wrote to a friend in Paris, gazing whole hours at the Maison Carré like a lover at his mistress. He had a stucco model made of it and shipped it back to Richmond, and he bullied the legislature into accepting it as the basis of the new design. At the core of the State House, where the statue of the god would have gone in a real Roman temple, there is a figure of George Washington. It was commissioned in 1788 from the French sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdin, and he gave America its first really good public sculpture, a superb display of neoclassical style and intelligence. Insofar as a single figure can, this expresses an idea about democracy. It shows the statesman as citizen, not a king, not a god but first among equals. Jefferson specified that the size should be precisely that of a man. Anything bigger would be pretentious. So we don't see Washington as victorious general. He's a new Cincinnatus, the Roman hero who was called from civilian life to lead the army and return to his farm after victory. He leans on a bundle of rods, the Roman fasces, each rod a state, their union connoting strength. His sword is sheathed. And then there's the plough, the symbol of agrarian virtue and the planting of a new political order. Houdon's final touch, a marvellous one I think, is Washington's missing button. It lets you know that he's not a stickler for protocol. Democracy in dress. In reality, the Founding Fathers were more of a secular elite than Americans commonly imagine. Jefferson and Washington were both Freemasons. This is the largest Masonic temple in America, built in Alexandria, Virginia. It's modelled, supposedly, on Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem and dedicated to George Washington, whose flame is kept alight by the keepers of the shrine. But now inflation has set in. Washington is not the size of a man, he is a bronze colossus, four times life size. George Washington, of course, was the most prominent Freemason. Harry Truman was a devoted Freemason. He dedicated the statue of George Washington in 1950. Over 50% of those who signed our Constitution were Freemasons. Uh, over 50% uh, who signed the Declaration of Independence were also Freemasons. And we have had 14 presidents documented as being Freemasons. And their conduct in office pretty well uh, indicates to most of us that they have had good moral training, which probably was a result of the obligations that they assumed when they became Masons. Masonic imagery was so important in the politics of the American Enlightenment that it even found its way onto the dollar bill, the eye of universal knowledge above the pyramid with the motto, a new order of the ages. In the 20th century, it would be lampooned by the American Dadaist Man Ray with his satirical sculpture made from a metronome called Object to be Destroyed. But the biggest Masonic image of all was the monument to George Washington in the city that bears his name. 
555 feet high, the biggest obelisk ever made beyond the wildest dreams of the pharaohs. The Washington Monument is so much a part of America's mental landscape by now that it's hard to imagine anyone ever objected to it. But they did, vehemently. The political fuss and bother over the designs was so great that this one wasn't actually approved until 1848, nor was it finished until 1885. And in the meantime, every imaginable faction got in on the act. Some politicians thought the simpler designs didn't pay enough respect to the great Washington, and other people thought the more elaborate designs made him out to be a Caesar or a king, but not a Democrat. At one point it was even proposed that all the surviving veterans of the Revolutionary War of 1776 should somehow or other be brought to Washington where they would each fling several shovelfuls of earth on this site, thereby creating a large mound over the memory of the great man, a kind of national anthill. But in the end, an army engineer came up with a perfect and abstract form with a steam elevator inside to get people to the top the tallest stone structure in the world. Its critics compared it to a stalk of asparagus, and Mark Twain thought it looked like a factory chimney with the tip broken off. But it is also a colossus whose figure is absent, sublimated. Its impersonal beauty takes your breath away. It's the midpoint between the first heroic style of America, neoclassicism, and the last one, minimal art.